sound good? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for turning up on a Saturday and our first sunny day of the festival this week uh, to talk about the lessons of EU internet regulation. My name is Natalie Turvey. I'm president of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, which does beg the question, why did they ask a Canadian to moderate a discussion on EU tech regulation? Uh, it's not because Canadians are one of the nicest populations on earth, we, we are, uh, but also as a rule, uh, Canadians are diplomatic, uh, we strive to see both sides of an argument, and we prefer compromise over hard lines, except when it comes to our favorite hockey teams, and uh, then there is no passive to our aggressive. Uh, Europe is leading the world in uh, regulating the internet and data protection is just one example of Europe's influence over other countries. The right to be forgotten is making its way to our shores in Canada in some form. And we're seeing the Brussels effect as our privacy commissioner is uh, looking to the European example in drafting our own version of the law which will have implications for not just uh, the platforms in Canada, but for also for our newsrooms. At the same time, uh, the CJF just conducted a poll. I had a chance to share the results uh, in another session on uh, attitudes toward the media, both in Canada and the US. And we found that 91% of both populations uh, believe that protecting a free press from political interference is essential to our democracy. So how can we strike a balance uh, in a new regulatory regime for the future of the net? So we're going to set this up as a debate. I think it's going to be a lively one uh, around the positives and negatives of EU regulation so far and the intended and unintended consequences of doing too much or not doing enough. Uh, this is important and this is timely, uh, so we want to hear from you as well. So we'll reserve some time at the end for your questions. I'm joined by Jeff Jarvis. Uh, most of you know Jeff. He's one of the world's leading uh, journalism thinkers and someone who to date has been critical, uh, highly critical sometimes, of um, net regulation so far. And I'm also joined by Paul Nemitz, who is principal advisor in the Directorate General for Justice and Consumers of the European Commission. In his previous role as director, he led the work to put the GDPR in place under the authority of the commission. So we're gonna dive right into our debate uh, on the pros and cons of tech regulation. And I'm going to give each of our speakers about seven minutes uh, to lay out their positions. And we are going to start with Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, let me say that I think uh, in, in these times of uh, democracy being under fire, we first have to ask a very basic question. Do we want democracy to function and do we want laws to be the product of democracy? Because that is really the classic notion, the most uh, noble expression of democratic engagement of elections is that parliaments produce laws which deal with the most essential issues in society? Or do we follow a vision of the world where actually the most important principle is the unbroken internet, a world in which technology and markets rule? Now, if we follow the notion that democracy, also in the age of internet and AI taking over, still um, is important for us, then I think um, we have to ask ourselves, is democracy functioning? Does it provide the laws which are necessary to secure freedom? And including providing that uh, the fourth estate journalistic activities still have a chance. Now I would say the key attack on the freedom of journalism and also on the economic basis of journalism in the US or in Europe is certainly not EU law. We have three angle of attacks which we have to look at. First, we have governments who try to have a grab on the press. And we see that in America, if you see what Trump is doing and you see journalists leaving America who, you know, already when Snowden was news, you know, they are worried about press freedom in America. Uh, but you also see it in Europe in many member states. 
So checking power of governments trying to get their hands on press is a very important function of the law. And we have to work on this. Second, media concentration, it's a classic. And again, we need laws to be able to intervene and say no to certain mergers, no to certain consolidations of economic nature, which reduce press plurality. And the third angle of attack is the platform economy, the internet, and the old laws which give an advantage of such an economic nature to the platforms that they are able to operate in the competition for the attention of people and in the competition for advertisement much more successfully than press. So to give you an example, the liability exemption for platforms relating to third-party content is uh, not available for press. So press needs moderators which have to check whether the content third parties put on, comments by readers, for example, are legal or not. That costs three to five percent of the presence on the internet for these companies. This is a cost disadvantage for press compared to platforms, which both in America and in Europe are advantaged by old law. Platform economy is very flexible when it comes to taxation. We in the European Commission, we had to make a decision you know, ordering Apple to pay 11 billion of taxes which they didn't pay in Ireland. And uh, platform economy chooses its locations of, you know, of seats um, of subsidiaries according to tax optimization principles. The good old press is not able to do this and not willing to do it. So I could give you a lot of examples of where the law needs to be adjusted to create a new level playing field between platforms and media. And all of this before we come to issues like copyright or uh, GDPR. I'm sure in our discussion we will touch on these points more. But I would say, and that's my um, thesis for today, if we want to make democracy work again in Europe, also in the states which are moving towards autocracy. And if we want to maintain living democracy in Europe, we have to develop policies and laws which support the fourth estate. And we have to do this consciously and actively. So we need something new. We need an overarching policy for the press in Europe in the next mandate, a, a, a policy for active democracy. And uh, so I would say um, the European Union can be an actor for democracy, and it has been an actor for democracy. We have done, you know, net neutrality. We've done just recently the whistleblower uh, directive. It will be voted now on, 20, on the week between 18th and, uh, April and 26th of April in the European Parliament. That was an initiative of my department, protecting whistleblowers. Um, this is important for law enforcement and companies, but it's also important for journalists in an ever more complex technological uh, environment to have people from the inside who give you information like Edward Snowden, of course, uh, did. We reduced the taxes for online uh, journalistic startups, the um, VAT. Um, and let me close by saying, fighting, for example, violence and incitement to hate on the internet and thereby limiting the freedom of speech is very important to protect journalists because we cannot have it that, for example, women journalists don't dare to write anymore and give up their jobs because of all the trolling of threatening them to be raped, to be uh, subject to violence and so on. So the idea that we need a total hands-off and let's just leave it to the market and to the platform companies that that is the best for journalism and free press, I would submit, is a complete misunderstanding. In societies where, and we have that in Europe, we have a huge rise of political violence. We must act against this violence, in particular when it's addressed towards representatives of democracies like members of parliaments or honorary mayors in small villages, and also when it's addressed against journalists. So the libertarian plea, neoliberal, Less law is always better, I would say, is fundamentally anti-democratic. Thank you very much.
Jack? My, uh, does a very good job of playing to the audience in, uh, in journalists. Uh, I want to make clear to the beginning is that though I am in favor of many freedoms and in favor of internet uh, freedom, I am not a libertarian. I'm a Kamala <laughs> a voter, so I'm a good Democrat, uh, just to be clear here, uh, a good liberal. Um, I think that much of the regulation that has been passed uh, through European countries and the EU has been well-intentioned but has brought uh, many unintended consequences. And I think that the sources of much of this regulation uh, can be problematic. Uh, I think some of it comes from a certain moral panic that rests more on uh, fear than on evidence. Uh, we'll call on Rasmus Kleiss Nielsen in the audience later because he uh, is very good at pointing out what the research actually says about where we are. I think in the case of uh, especially the Leistungsschutzrecht in Germany, it uh, came from uh, protectionism for industry uh, over rights. Uh, publishers use their political capital to get this passed. Uh, I fear uh, imperiling uh, freedom of expression and knowledge. I think that uh, chapters, uh, articles 11 and 13 are an abomination that could kill the internet. Um, many of these standards are vague and unenforceable. If you look at Netzdege in Germany, uh, you see not only uh, efforts to go against hate speech, but also odd things like insult. Um, I think that there's a problem here in transferring uh, government obligations to the companies. And the irony of some of this regulation, the irony of most of this regulation, is that it attempts to reduce the power of the platforms but only gives them more power. So in the case of the right to be forgotten, Google now decides what can and cannot be remembered in search. In the case of Netzdege, Facebook decides what is illegal and what is hateful uh, and insulting. Um, in the case of uh, other regulations, I think that uh, in the case of GDPR, which is again well-intentioned, uh, the major platforms are in a better position to afford to have to deal with all of its requirements and small companies uh, or large companies in small countries uh, have more problem. So I think my esteemed opponent would try to paint me as a libertarian, <laughs> um, but I'm not. I have not, I'm not opposed to regulation. I just ask a few things. First, that it be based on actual harm, measurable evidence, uh, rather than fears or things that could happen. Uh, I think we need, we need a lot more research on, on what is happening. Uh, second, that it be clearly written. And third, that government not uh, abrogate its responsibilities to the platforms. That to me is the greatest irony of much of this regulation is that I think much of what is government's job, um, they've handed over. I joined a, uh, and this is a very long title, uh, Transatlantic High Level Working Group on uh, Content Moderation and Freedom of Expression, read regulation, uh, that was convened by Susan Ness, a former um, Federal Communications Commissioner in the US, a regulator, and uh, out of the University of Pennsylvania and also out of the University of Amsterdam. And at the first meeting, I was surprised that, I, that we came to, I think, a very good middle ground uh, that I want to outline really quickly. Draw a hard line between behavior that is merely bad and that is illegal. If behavior is illegal, it should be handled by government and the courts. And what we've done with much of this regulation, in the case of Netzdege, for example, is forced a company to become the legislature, the police, the jury, the judge, and the jailer. And it's not their job to do that, and they'll be bad at that. And so at this meeting, I heard a proposal for an internet court, national internet courts, which I actually found to be quite fascinating, because what it does is say that when there's matters of illegality happening on a platform, they should be able to push that to a court where decisions are made by a new crop of trained judges in this view, and that the person who proposed this, it was under Chatham House rule, and he doesn't want me to give him credit, so I won't say anything more, but, but the person who proposed this points out that too often now, our negotiation of legal norms is happening behind closed doors inside corporations. It should be happening in courts with openness and due process. So to me, government, ironically, has abrogated its responsibility about legality. It should take that over. So that's below the line of illegality. 
above that line, when you get to just unappetizing behavior, uh, that is in the province of the platforms, community uh, standards or terms of service. And the, the proposal I heard at this um, meeting, based on some really interesting experimentation going on in France, where they're doing role playing around potential regulation with one of the platforms, uh, Facebook, um, that uh, I'd love to see it go to what is in America, the Federal Trade Commission model, mm -hmm. which is that a platform has a covenant with its public, its users, its customers, and the government of the nation. And each platform could have a different covenant. So there isn't a net stay gay that covers everybody. Each platform could be appropriate to its platform. When, the, when and if the platform does not meet its requirements under that, then it is liable. Then the regulator, Federal Trade Commission in the US, comes after them in essence for consumer fraud. You said you would do this and you didn't. Um, so that leaves each platform able to, to negotiate its norms with its community over time. Finally, the, the objection I have in the end is I think that the internet is far too young to define mm -hmm. and limit and regulate. We don't know what it is yet. It's early days. In Gutenberg time, we're only at the year 1475, 25 years away from the introduction of the commercial web. It, we still see it in the analog of the past. We still regulate and legislate about it in the analog of the past. We don't know what it is yet. And so we need flexible structures that will enable uh, conversation and a negotiation of norms through companies and communities in terms of service on the bad behavior side and through legislatures and courts on the illegal behavior side. Mm -hmm. So, a, a, I think a, a fine middle ground. <laughs> you, you can respond. Now, before you do, Paul, Jeff called Articles 11 and 13 an abomination to the internet. What is your response to that? Uh, my, response is, uh, my response to that is very simple. We had an earlier panel here today uh, with representatives of the French journalism and press on Julie Jaune. And in this, um, uh, in this panel, there, I think there was unanimity that the copyright directive is exactly what we need, uh, uh, at least the best we could get. My view is, to be very honest, now I say my personal opinion, um, I think it actually doesn't go far enough because now the platforms, power, powers of platforms have to negotiate with the publishers who are of course much weaker. I would have liked to see a system which actually doesn't even make this negotiation necessary. I am in favor of supporting many things which bring the money back from the platform to the fourth estate. I'm convinced the cacophony of the internet does not replace the structured contribution of fourth estate journalism to f democracy. So we are losing something from the internet. And how this is done, I must say, you know, I'm very open. So for example, I would have preferred a system which doesn't even make it necessary to negotiate, but which is just an obligatory licensing system. You know, like we had it, for example, for tape, rec empty tapes. You remember the time when we had music tapes and when you went to the shop and you bought an empty tape to record music, let's say from the radio, there was a fee on it. So, uh, you know, I would have liked to see a system where the platforms just have to pay a flat fee for using all this content produced by journalists and press, and that's it. We'll see now whether this system works, whether actually the intention, which is bring back, to bring back some money to journalism and press actually works, um, you know, and maybe then we have to have a second shot. But it is vital to bring the money back to the fourth estate. Right now, if I see it correctly, according to the statistics of the IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, 80% of the revenues from online uh, advertising go to two companies. And this is the same problem in America and in Europe, Facebook and Google. And that's why you can buy a newspaper for an apple and an egg uh, not a lot of money, except of course the New York Times, which is now, you know, has the model and everybody should do it like that. Well, it's not going to work like that. We have a dying of the profession of journalists and we have a dying of newspapers for economic reasons which have to do something with the entrepreneurial success of these companies, fair enough, but in our constitutions in Europe, 
The principle is, if you have property and if you are economically successful, it is very normal that if this success goes hand in hand with some negatives, namely in this case, the economic shift of money from the force estate to the platforms, that democracy can decide to take certain measures to rebalance. Uh, you know, like we redistribute income through taxes, we also structure our economy uh, uh, in such a way that, you know, it works in the public interest. Now, let me say something. I cannot respond to, to all the points of Jeff, but I would like to say, <coughs> first of all, I don't try to paint you as a, as a, <laughs> a, a neoliberal. I very much enjoy the discussions with you, and I think these discussions are important because we have a problem, and we need all good brains to work on this, and we have to look everywhere, also in America, on the good things which work. So I'm all in favor if people say, you know, this and this works well in America, let's copy it. But I have to respond on one point, and I think that's a crucial point, and it's a crucial misunderstanding. This argument that NetzDG and other measures which we have taken in Europe, for example, uh, also the code of conduct on hate speech and xenophobia, which I've negotiated with Facebook, Google, and others, that this actually shifts power to the companies, and therefore it shouldn't be like that. Only if a judge or the government orders it, the companies should be obliged to take down illegal content. And that I totally disagree. Why? Because it creates an even more big privilege for these companies and it makes them absolutely unaccountable. Of course they would wish that. They would wish that they can just keep the clickbait out there and if it's as dirty and illegal and hateful and violent because that creates money for them. And I have to break the news to you, Jeff, that the reality in capitalism is that companies have to comply the, by the law. Everybody has to take, pay their tax before the government says anything and before a judge says something. And everybody has to obey copyright, social law, labor law, environmental law, and also internet law. And the idea that from now on in capitalism, companies only have to comply after the government has ordered them on an individual case or, in, or a judge has ordered them is ludicrous. Every newspaper, every television station, every radio station has to make the judgment call every day what they do with their third content, third party content, because they by law are obliged to ensure they don't have the liability privilege that there is no illegal content on their website even if the content comes from third parties. So what you are saying is, to be very clear, while the press and media should have this obligation, must employ people for this, and they do it. They have moderators, and they must have lawyers in-house who do it, or lawyers on retainer, who they can ask, what are we going to do about this comment? They have to carry those costs, and the platforms should be free. They should only be allowed, uh, obliged to act once the government has ordered them or a judge has ordered that. I would say, you know, dream on. These companies, and that is the biggest problem we are facing today, have to learn responsibility towards democracy and the general public, and that means they have to act before the government or a judge has told them. Of course, they have to read the jurisprudence, because in Europe, in contrast to America, and that's the problem, we have ample jurisprudence which tells the newspapers and the TV exactly where's the line between what is still okay in terms, for example, of aggressive speech and there's a lot okay, aggressive speech in democracy is okay, and where the harassment and the violence and the threats start, which are not okay, yes? We have huge jurisprudence like that. We have the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which has a great jurisprudence. In contrast to America, our countries are controlled from the outside. It's a court which is outside the countries, which controls them and which has created all this body of jurisprudence. And what I'm saying is, Jeff, this is very simple. These American companies, when they operate in Europe, for example, they have to apply this jurisprudence like our press has to apply it. And they have to apply it on their own initiative. Yeah? So, you know, this idea that companies only have to act after a judge has, you know, no, that cannot work. 
So I think that is the most important um, argument, and I also don't agree with this argument that we give them more power. The reality is, of course, complying means they have to comply with the laws which are set out by our parliaments, by our democracy, and which are then interpreted by our judges. Yeah? And they don't want to because they think, and there we come to your FTC model, they rule the world through their standards of service. And that's, I would say, that's exactly the conflict between what do we want? Do we want a world where democracy plays a role and where they are obliged to obey our laws when they come to Europe? Or do we want a world where California capitalism sets all the rules? Yeah? And, you know, make no mistake, that's what they want. The Google right to be forgotten case. In the first place, if you read the judgment on the Spanish guy who said, you know, I want Google not to uh, show when, uh, you know, what I, problems in marriage I had in the past. In this case, and you can read it in the judgment, Google went to great lengths to say, well, first of all, only American law applies because the answer to your search question comes from California. Second, the only judge which is competent to help you, European citizen, if you have a problem with us, Google, is the judge in California. That is the world view of Google, our host here. The world view of American law dominating everywhere and American judges being the only one competent to discipline this company. So that means European citizens without any protection factually, because who of us can afford to go to a California court? And I think that has to end. These companies have to learn that democracy means that they have to obey our rules when they operate here. Um, so I'm not a libertarian or a Californian, I'm a New Yorker. So let's make that, let's make that, let's make that clear. Uh, you got a problem with that? Um, so uh, let me answer a few things there. Um, one is I think you're trying too hard to disagree a bit in that uh, the problem with the enforcement of, let's say, Nets de Gay, which you didn't write, so I, you, I, I'm not blaming you for it, but the problem is that the law is vaguely written. It is not clear. Uh, and uh, what it forces the companies to do is it puts them in a position to, again, be police, judge, jury within 24 hours. They have to decide without any judges what is manifestly illegal, and they have to take it down within 24 hours or face a huge fine. So what happens? They have hired 30,000 people at Facebook to, uh, to, 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 to grapple with this. Uh, but my, my observation here is that satire is dead in Germany. There's a straight line there. Um, uh, because they're going to play it safe. They're going to take down anything that is going to seem to get them in trouble. And that is not an aligned interest with society. And I think we need a system of, I'm asking for regulation, I'm asking for courts. I'm not agreeing, by the way, with Mark Zuckerberg. I do not want to see a worldwide regulation where we'll end up with the lowest common denominator of freedom and the highest watermark of regulation and China and internet will take over the web. I don't want that. I don't want the French fake news law affecting me in America. I want to hold on to my First Amendment because we believe in the power of freedom of speech. I want to hold on to my Section 230 because we believe that there's an opportunity for a safe harbor. Let me just go then to two other points you made, Powell. Uh, one is that in your argument about 11 and 13, and God help you, even stronger, even worse, um, you're arguing that this is somehow uh, writing the world as if God gave media companies the revenue they used to have. God didn't. Uh, they could have held on to that revenue by competing well, uh, by being smart, but they insisted, and I know because this is my industry, this is our tribe, uh, insisted on trying to hold on to its protectionist old ways and didn't innovate, didn't work ahead, didn't serve the advertisers well. Um, so I don't think that there's a um, writing of the system, that there's a rebalancing that presumes that what existed in the past was in balance. It wasn't. Mass media is fundamentally an insult to the public. Mass media treats everyone all the same. Mass media is what the internet killed, thank fucking goodness. That now voices who were never heard and never represented in mass media can finally be heard and can finally have a voice. 
I celebrate that, which gets to my main point. Where we most fundamentally disagree, I think, is in your Weltanschauung that what we're talking about is content. <laughs> that um, the internet is not content. That is a Gutenberg era media worldview. What we're talking about here is conversation. Democracy fundamentally is a conversation. And what the internet begins to do, and these are rough days, these are early days, what it begins to do is enable the conversation, is to enable these voices that were not heard in mass media to finally be heard if there is freedom. But between all of these regulations, I fear there's going to be a negative impact on that conversation uh, to the simple level that things like memes are a new alphabet of the conversation. When my daughter shares a video, she's not saying, this is a product of content I recommend that you consume. What she's saying is, this speaks for me. This is part of my conversation with my friend. This says something that I want to say. We in media should learn how to make social tokens that enable and fulfill people's conversations in that way. We should rethink fundamentally what we do. So when you put this under the metaphor of property and conversation, that is with respect a diehard Gutenberg era view and Gutenberg's era is over. And so we have to rethink this. We are in very, very early days again. Um, again, I would argue that we're in the year 1475 in Gutenberg years. And I'm not saying this is going to be an easy transition. We may have a 30 years war, a few peasants war, and a reformation ahead of us. This could be tough. But it, it, it's, it's necessary that society has the tools to be able to hold its conversation with itself and to be able to negotiate its new norms in this new reality. And we in journalism had better damn well learn how to help feed that conversation. Thus, I've redefined journalism because I have tenure and I can do obnoxious things like that. <laughs> and so my new definition of journalism is to convene communities into civil, informed, and productive conversation. Say it again, to convene communities into civil, informed, and productive conversation. Mm -hmm. Let me put an asterisk there. The word civil is a bit troubling because it could mean a definition put down from the powerful, but please put that aside for a moment. Uh, dignified, uh, call it what you will, informed and productive. In this age today, we're hating each other. And by the way, I haven't done this yet in the conference. I want to apologize to all of the rest of the world for Donald fucking Trump. And what, we're, what we've done. But Donald Trump is not a result of the internet. Donald Trump is a result of Fox News and Rupert Murdoch and old media. Donald Trump uh, comes from, he is the ultimate clickbait candidate. Uh, true, but he, the presidents of CNN and then CBS both said that he may be bad for America but good for their business. So you want to give money back to old media and back to mass media because you think that's the right proper balance of the world. I come from the world of mass media. I don't think that's the proper balance of the world. What I want to look forward to is a world where the public can figure out how to have this conversation, and that's going to be hard, and we're going to mess up, and we're going to be mean to each other, and we're going to screw up. But that's what a democracy enables and allows, is just that kind of freedom. It is too soon to clamp down and presume that you preserve the old ways in a new world. I think this is a great debate, <laughs> and I like... I'm going to go sit in the audience in, in no, one I'm second. Sorry, I mean um, well, I'm going to let you make your point, uh, and there is leg legitimacy in both sides of these arguments. I think we have enough material to take this into a week-long uh, <laughs> symposium, but can we ready. <laughs> try to find something that we agree on? Jeff is clearly not against all regulation. Um, can we find a middle ground? Yes. I think we can, because I like, and you know, I'm not an expert like you on the media, I'm getting into it. I come from constitutional law and learning here. I like your, uh, the conversation, uh, we convene communities uh, to, for dignified, civil and informed conversations. And um, so I think, you know, yes, this is, has a lot of merit. But I would also like to hear from you as the man who knows whether the sentence that the cacophony of the internet will not replace what we are losing in the contribution of fourth estate journalism, a journalism which has the aspiration to control power and to contribute to democratic control and democratic debate, is wrong. 
Because, let me also be clear to you, Jeff, you as a professor with tenure from America, you can easily say, maybe we have a 30-year war before us. I cannot. In Europe, we have an increase of political violence based on anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and so on, of 400% over the last years. So what we are discussing here is not a theoretical, academical, or technical question on the internet and its future and Gutenberg and so on. We are discussing here the conditions under which some people die in Europe and the conditions under which we have democracy or not. Because we have countries here where democracy is under threat and we have countries where we have a huge increase, even more than what I just said, that's just the average, of political violence. So, and in this context, you know, the question is, are we able, through our way of shaping our society, to do more then just leave it to the market and to the FTC model. Because also to be very clear on this, this is the American model and it means a company makes a, pro a promise to its customers, it's public. For, also on privacy, it's the same rules. Mm -hmm. And then the FTC is supposed to ensure that the company keeps this promise. And you're absolutely right, then the companies make choices on privacy or maybe on community rules. So uh, the downside of this is that some, some companies sh make choices which are good uh, for the public interest and uh, amenable to you know, society working well, and some companies make choices which are purely oriented to profit, which are really creating a lot of external costs, and they get away with it. Because, for example, you know, what happens with personal data, you don't know it. So, you know, you don't realize what's happening with your data behind uh, the closed doors of the companies and, you know, these companies make huge profits without making the promise. Mm -hmm. And that is one societal model. The other societal model is to say, we regulate in a democratic process by law what companies should be doing. We are not going to leave it to their choice whether they make the promise or not. We set down certain rules on protecting uh, and respecting the control of people over their personal data, the informational self-determination, or, for that matter, on the obligations of press and platforms on their own initiative to take down incitement to violence and hate speech. And this is the European way. And I would say, you know, if we mean it with democracy, we have to continue uh, uh, doing this, and you know, let me also be clear how you describe NetzDG is a satire of the law. There has been no decision of any uh, huge fine. The fine is not due in relation to individual takedowns not taking place. It is due if a company, in a systematic and structural way, does not provide for taking down, doesn't set up the system Yes, and uh, so, um, you know, the satire is that in Germany because of NetzDG, you know, that's just a satire of the reality which you are painting. NetzDG is not making anything new illegal which wasn't illegal before, but it serves to break it to Facebook and Google and others that they have to obey with our rules. And you see, the irony is, uh, uh, Jeff, I had negotiated a, a code of conduct voluntary. Which the I think is content. better. Which yeah, is but better. wait, with the same content. And you know why it works? Only because the Germans made the law. Why? Because the companies, they hate like fire any law which obliges them to anything. Our voluntary European code of conduct would not work as well if the Germans wouldn't have done the law. And I'll also be very clear. They did this law in the last meeting of the parliament before the elections. And there was a huge consensus in Parliament to make this law. And you know why there was this huge consensus? Only for one reason. To make it clear to the citizens and to the world that it's not Facebook which rules. It is the Parliament which sets the rules. 
So what we are discussing about here in the end is the very fundamental question. Is there a primacy of democracy and therefore law, or is there a primacy of technology and capitalism? That's what we're debating here, and everybody has to make up their mind where they stand on this debate. And we have European elections coming up soon. So look at the programs of the parties and what they say about this. This is not small fry. So we're getting close to um, uh, our time to turn it over to the audience. But Jeff, before we do that, I want to tease out two points. And very quickly, uh, you make a call for research, which I think is valid and important. What kind of research is needed? And secondly, I, I want you to tell our audience a little bit more about this idea of internet court and how it dovetails with what Mr. Nemitz just said around codes of conduct and the law. So uh, I mentioned before Rasmus Kleist Nielsen, who went off to another session from the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford. Every time on uh, the Twitter when somebody says, we are in filter bubbles and we must intervene and act on filter bubbles, Rasmus points us to the research, which says it doesn't find filter bubbles. It finds the opposite. Uh, it finds that online people are actually more aware of their opponent's arguments. Um, then we also hear that these young people today, oh, God damn these young people today, they're screwing up the world. They don't care about facts. They can't understand facts versus fiction. They're spending too much time on Facebook. They're spreading lies. Well, there was a study just out of Princeton and NYU that took a corpus of, pardon me, fake news uh, crap and looked at who was sharing it. Uh, it was people who looked like me, old white men, which is to say the kids are all right. It's grandpa who's fucking up the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so the research is critical, critical here in a few ways. One, I don't think regulators should ever step in until there is evidence of harm. And maybe that's a fundamental disagreement. But I, I think it's to, to preemptively say this is the world we're going to design when we don't really know the, 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 the basis of that world, I think is the extreme hubris. And when I live in a country that may not be as bad as Hungary or Turkey, but it's headed that way with Donald Trump, that's the last person I trust to oversee the public speech. Uh, yes, he may be in charge of government, but he's an autocrat, as you said. So I do believe that there is a value in trying to let society do what society wants to do. And when there is actual harm, that's when you step in, and that's when we'll agree that there is a need for regulation. But we need the research to know what the actual harm is. So I think we need a lot, and by the way, part of the idea of this two-tiered uh, regulatory approach with the FTC world is that part of what's ne needed in that is that the companies have to agree to hand over data to the regulator so that their performance can be monitored. That also means that the government needs to give the company safe harbor for handing over data because after Cambridge Analytica, they're scared shitless about handing over any data. And third, I think they should be required to and given safe harbor to hand over data to researchers so we can figure out what the actual harm is. So that's on the kind of regulatory question and, and voluntary. On the court, uh, I surprised myself that I found this to be an intriguing idea. Um, again, I, I, I can't give credit to the person who, who had the idea. It's not mine at all, but, but this person didn't want uh, credit and gave me permission to write about it, which I did on Medium, if you're curious. Um, I, I think that the problem here is that, Paolo, you say that the companies must enforce the law, the companies must enforce the law. The problem is that the companies, because of the scale we're involved with, again, the companies are in a position of being the police, and you know what? There's not much choice about that. They have to be. They've got to be in a position of policing. Now, now part of the idea behind this is that unless, except in the absolute worst cases of incitement to um, terrorism or child porn or such, which they would be liable for, period, their liability would not arise until they had been notified by users or government of violating um, conduct, let's call it. Con content, you might call it, I'll call it conduct. Um, at that point, yes, the company, and part of their terms of service is to be against illegal content. The company can take it down. But there's nothing, I'm not stopping them from doing that. I'm not telling them they have to wait for the court to do that. But in any case of dispute, Right now, it's the company that decides based on a huge fine over their heads. That's what's wrong. Um, so if, there's un if the company is not sure whether something is illegal, if the person whose con conduct is taken down wants to dispute this as a matter of their rights and due process, if uh, others outside disagree, there should be a court that is 
enabled to operate quickly and smartly to then deal with those things because that properly happens in the court. And again, I want to repeat, the person who created this idea said that the primary reason to do that is so that we negotiate these legal norms, this case law, in public with due process. That's not happening now because government has abrogated this job to the companies and said, you do this or you're in deep shit, companies. And that's not a good system. That's not a legal system. So we uh, have a full house on a beautiful Saturday, um, which speaks to how important this is to all of you in this room. So I want to turn it over to you for your questions now. Or for arguments. Jeff and, or arguments uh, for Jeff and for Paul. Do we have uh, a roving microphone? Thank you. Um, you were, um, Jeff, you were just saying um, if there is evidence of actual harm and um, with uh, these social platforms, we're talking about distribution and publication and how they are not, they don't have an editorial mind as um, a journalist, as uh, papers have. So um, there is a kind of, there is evidence of actual harm actually. And for instance, just this week here in Italy, um, in Rome, um, in the neighborhood of um, Torre Maura, where um, there are these uh, Sigonia, uh, Roma um, people who were uh, put in a house waiting for being transferred. And then one of the fascist person kind of um, called for, um, on Facebook, uh, people to go there and demonstrate and show hate. So that is evidence of actual harm um, on a small, big scale, whatever you want to um, call it. And uh, from my view, is um, as an example, you wouldn't, no, no paper will ever publish uh, a call. You know, I, I couldn't call a paper and say, I want to go and demonstrate, or there's this manifestation, come and let's meet there in front of this house. So because a newspaper wouldn't publish that. So just mm. question mark, there is evidence of actual harm in this little, um, it's not late, I mean, whatever you call, want to call it, but people are calling for these kind of demonstrations or hate on Facebook. So let me, let me answer in two, in two parts to that. Um, one is that, and again, I come from America, where we have a different tradition, and uh, we take it as, a, when I was growing up, it was, a, it was a lesson I had to learn and a point of pride that the American Civil Liberties Union uh, fought for the right of Nazis to march in Skokie, a Jewish predominantly Jewish town. Why, do we do, why would we allow that? Because we believe in freedom of speech and the response to bad speech is more speech, is good speech. And I see a real danger here to this doctrine that speech is good now. I believe speech is fundamentally good and it includes the bad and I believe that humanity will figure it out and add the good. Now to your, your primary point here is you're making, as most do, an analogy between a platform and media. I strenuously argue that the platforms are not media. Uh, they are not publishers. Uh, they are a, a connection machine, a mechanism for people to connect with each other, with conversation, with information, uh, and so on. And so we make a mistake in trying to once again use the analog of the past to regulate the future here, and I think we end up making mistakes there. So there's not, I don't think any of us wants an editor at Facebook to be sitting there saying that's okay and that's not, that's okay and that's not. They don't want that, I don't want that. Um, the community should be able to rise an alarm and say, we find this unacceptable, get rid of it. That's what happened in the case of InfoWars in the US. Uh, the rules didn't say to get rid of InfoWars, but the, but the public said, I don't care what your rules are, uh, get rid of it because your rules shouldn't support that. And they, and they got the courage to do that finally, taking a good dose of political shit along the, along the way. So I, I think it's a mistake to look at the platforms as if they are publications. I don't want someone to come in and edit my blog. That's why I love my blog is because I don't have any fucking editors at last, right? And so I have the, the freedom to say whatever I want and words like fuck if I want to, and it's okay. I couldn't do that in my old newspaper and that's why I, I enjoy the freedom I have now. Uh, can, can, we, can, yeah. can we give the opportunity for someone else just with uh, a lot of people in the room uh, at the back right there? No, this is a, really a follow-up uh, on the lady's question because right after that protest, a 15-year-old boy from the same neighborhood came out and faced the fascists 
and the video of him explaining why the Roma people shouldn't be discriminated went viral on YouTube. So a normal media would have uh, uh, called for the protest, but a normal media would have probably gave voice to this boy. So your point, Jeff, is that inside the uh, internet there are also the, um, the good um, parts that, that can uh, uh, provide themselves the, 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 you know, the, 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 the good speech that we need, really. And um, the regulation can, can arm that, too. What, one, one line that I, uh, I think we tend to try to look at Twitter, for example, as if it's the New York Times. It's not. It's Times Square. And there's a lot of people there, and some of them are smart, and some of them are stupid, and some of them are right, and some of them are wrong. That's a democracy. Yes. Uh, I think, uh, Jeff, I think on all of what you have said, we agree, with one exception, that there are some outer limits on the continent where fascism has killed millions of people. It is not allowed, like it is in America, you know, to use the swastika or to mm -hmm. deny the Holocaust. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about Facebook and Google having an editor which saying, I like this, I don't like that. That's not the issue. The issue is whether the outer limits which we have set for press should also be respected by the platforms. And I would say another limit where we are different to America is the violent speech, the incitement to violence. Now, the only thing, for example, the next DJ and I am saying is if there's an evident First sight, clear call to violence. So for let's take your example. It's not just an invitation to, to the uh, uh, neighborhood to demonstrate, but a text which, for example, says, let's get the baseball bats and teach them ba uh, baseball sticks and teach them a lesson. Yeah? This is something which is an incitement to violence and would be illegal here in America, maybe not yet, because it's a little bit less than you know fire, the call for fire, the famous. And there we are a little bit different. And um, there are reasons why we have a different um, history, but I would like it to be on the record. We love free speech, we love our democracy, we fight for it, and also I'm a little bit fed up with the lessons from America about free speech for one reason, which is that if you look at the freedom index for journalism, Europe is before America, not behind. Tough, tough crowd, Jeff. <laughs> I expected nothing less. Hi. I, we have time for one or two more questions. Thank you. Do we you. have uh, any hands up? Oh, yeah. uh, microphone. Idea, idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, it's a um, reflection. Um, if a company has to do some policing in content, this means that uh, they should uh, implement uh, as best uh, the value of the uh, place where uh, this uh, content policing is happening, because you want to respect uh, the local uh, law or local uh, code of um, behave and avoid what is cultural imperialism, avoid that uh, foreign law get imposed uh, somewhere else. But in the other sense, uh, we know that uh, in a certain uh, country, uh, we lack of uh, human rights uh, and the freedom of expression, and uh, you want to actually bring something more. So what is the line? Yes, I have completely understood your question. It's a very important question. Now, I call it the tech companies imposing the check of Erdogan and China and Putin on European law. How does the argument go? It goes like this. If you make content limitations in Europe according to European law, that is a precedent for Erdogan to make content limitations that he cannot be criticized anymore, and it's a precedent for the Chinese Communist Party and for Putin. Mm -hmm. Now, this argument has mm -hmm. to be rejected firmly. Why? Because in Europe, the rules in our constitution and set by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg is that, of course, the content limitations are only legal when they are necessary in a democratic society and proportional to the purpose. And whether this is the case is controlled by independent judges. So, if the tech imperialists come to us and say, from now on, you cannot make a law anymore because that law would be abused by China and so on, we have to say, guys, 
that means we cannot do any law anymore because it's not only about content legislation. Any law will be abused by dictatorships. That cannot be our test. Our test is, is the law necessary in a democratic society? Is it proportional? And is it controlled by independent judges? And you see in China or in, in Turkey or in Russia, none of these conditions are fulfilled. Here they are. And that's why our laws are legitimate and why the test of China and Erdogan imposed by Silicon Valley is not legitimate. So we're now tech imperialists from the lands that invented colonialism, but we'll move past that. Um, so, uh, no, I, I think the argument, I, I disagree, Paul, obviously. I think that when, once a precedent, precedent is set, then the other governments attempt to use it. Uh, and that's uh, number one. Number two, we expect the platforms to uphold human rights in Hungary and Turkey and elsewhere. And so on the one hand, we say follow our laws, but don't follow theirs. That's a very difficult position for them to be in. Number three, I see a, a growing trend for certain nations, certain good nations, to try to spread their laws into other laws. I don't want France's right to be forgotten. I don't want France to decide what I can and cannot see. Uh, yet that is the way that the regulators are headed. And so talk about imperialism, that's legal imperialism. So uh, that brings <laughs> us all to time. Uh, we have been treated to a superb hour of debate from two heavyweights about the present and uh, possible future of EU tech regulation. So on behalf of the festival and the entire audience, I want to thank Jeff and Paul for uh, being with us for this for important patience. discussion. Thank you. Thank you.